Now the first verse that was one says, Now concerning the things where you wrote unto me. So the apostle was responding to questions that were asked of him by members of this church. They had written to him for clarification on many issues to deal with marital relationships between a husband and wife, what should happen, what should happen, especially dealing with sexual matters. Apparently, these members had some questions they could not resolve on their own and they wanted confirmation from a biblical or godly point of view from their father in the Lord, Apostle Paul. They knew that whatever he told them would be God's will. So they wanted God's decision on these matters. He said, It's good the man how to touch a woman. <laughs> so that was the concept that Paul said. That was written to me about this issues, but let me just establish it here. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. That is, that is the ideal state. But how many can attain to that? How many can attain to that? You know, our Lord Jesus Christ was single throughout his life. There is no record of him ever having married or having a girlfriend or anything like that. No. Who was single, and there must have been a reason for that. We know, of course, Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, was married because the Bible says his mother in law was sick and Jesus healed her. But we know that Apostle Paul was never married. He had a sister, he had a, uh, an in law but, uh, from a sister, but he was never married. And the Bible says that if you really want to serve God fully, you should remain single because if you marry, your marital requirements would take time away from your fully serving God. That's what the Bible says in Corinthians, I think. So he said, let me establish this. This is the utopic or the perfect state for a man not to touch a woman. Now that makes you the first question why did God create women in that case? There are no women, there are no children, there are no procreation. But I guess he was talking regarding relationships between a man and a woman. That was referring to. Um, that was the Bible. Because they're ready to into asking questions, especially matters to do with the bedroom of sexual matters. So that's why they established not to touch a woman. That was the idea is for the man not to have sex with a woman. That you can be friends with them, you can, but this is the ideal state according to him. He's talking about somebody who wants to consecrate his life totally to God, and only few can deprive themselves or deny themselves to meet this expectation. You know, that's why he speaks later that not everybody could be like him. Some people have called, of course, for all kinds of names that he was uh, gay and all these things, and blaspheming God because he didn't marry. He said he was like gay. That's when I read the Bible. He just put down his own body for the sake of Christ. And you can do it. You're really committed. Alright? So nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Now what is fornication? Fornication is when a man has an affair with somebody she's not married to. So fornication can be premarital or postmarital. In other words, if you have sex with a woman, even though you're not married to her, that is fornication. If you have sex with a woman after you're married, that is adultery and is a form of fornication. Everything is under the title immorality. So God does not allow sexual relationship between a man and a woman and woman when they're not later in marriage. If you are doing that right now, you need to immediately stop it, ask God to forgive you, and repent of it. You may be in a relationship with a girl or a man right now, and you are freely having sex with them. And of course, you claim to be a Christian, possibly a body Christian, and you go to church, maybe you're able to choir, maybe you're a vocalist in the choir, maybe you're a side woman, or maybe you're a prophetess. And because everybody is doing it, you too, you are doing it. Well, let me tell you, Pastor Very to today, it is a sin. It is wrong, you will be judged for it unless you repent of it and turn from it. You 
if I find a way to see to be able to marriage when have a relationship to be able to marry man. Because once you have sex with a man who you are not married to, before you marry them, you have already cheapened yourself and you reduce the value of that relationship. It's supposed to be a God relationship. God created sex between a man and a woman, mainly for procreation, but also for pleasure. So if you've already said that you're joining before you marry that man, then after you marry that man or woman, you lower the value of that thing. It's no longer special. It's not common. See? So that's why it says to, to avoid fornication. So the ideal thing to be married with being single, but to avoid fornication, meaning that if you don't control your emotions, if you have a girlfriend and you're talking with her or whatever, and you're tempted to have sex with her, then the best is to marry her rather than go and have sex with her before you marry her. That's exactly what Paul is saying. He said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband as well. So for both sexes, you know, don't say, oh, I do not control myself. You start uh, uh, intimacy, kissing and all that, and the next thing you know, you fall into sexual intercourse. Please don't go near that area. In many countries, women are not even allowed to mix with men until they're married to them. Even if they're engaged, they're not allowed to be in the same room with them. There's always somebody there or somebody nearby. You know? So if you don't want to do that, then don't give in to temptation. Don't go and visit a man in their room without anybody else. And you think, oh, that man will control himself. No, no, no. You have to control yourself by staying far away from that temptation. I do not have a story of these people that were tested to be, they were asked to, well, to, to find the safest driver. And so when they got all the drivers, they said they had to drive near a cliff and everybody had to come back. So they were all given the same car and if you want to give opportunity to drive the closest to the cliff and to come back to the starting point. So all these drivers went very close. And then turned around and they were very happy to tell that they had won the competition. But do you know who won the competition? The driver that just moved an inch or two and came back he was the one that won the competition because the people, the people said he was the one that was wisest. He stayed far away from the cliff. That was the safest place. Don't say you're a good driver and you're going to risk your life going in the cliff. You could easily fall off. So, shy away from temptation is the solution. If you don't want to fall into the scene of fornication and adultery, shy away from it. Don't engage in sexting, sending naked pictures of your private organs to other opposite sex. Don't engage in emotional sex, discussing private sexual issues with somebody who you're not married to. Don't have chats or watch pornographic videos or anything like that. Those are fruits of temptation that they may can use to make you fall. Just have to stay far away. So that says, instead of all these temptations, why don't you just marry this woman? Then you can have as much sex as you want because it will be led away and you will not be a sin before God. For you that are single, you say you don't have sex with a girl, but what are you doing? You're having sex with somebody you don't know. How? By watching pornography. By watching men and women have sex, on videos, on photographs, magazines exposing their bodies. That is a form of fornication. Because that person you're watching, you're not married to them. And Jesus Christ said, if a man lost such a woman in his heart, he's already committed the act of adultery. Don't say, oh, I didn't sleep with that. No. If you've already watched a video of that woman, naked with video of her, you've already committed that out. And most men and women are involved in this, especially nowadays, that pornography is so readily available on the phones, on the website, you're just on your phone, and wow, what happens next? You just see a couple having sex out of nowhere. 
You don't immediately delete it, you be forced to watch it. And then they start sending you more and more. I remember one man telling us that I wanted to do a, a, a prayer meeting. And as they were coming in, they just saw these people come, come into the room, the Zoom meeting. And they actually had sex. They had to disrupt the meeting completely and close down the meeting. Then they put in a check so that they had to review those coming in before they allowed them in. It was only when they put the check in that they wouldn't just stop sending that video. Before they just allowed anybody to come in, then they realized that people were going to abuse that privilege. You see? So the whole world is corrupted. And you have to really stand down. You have to make up your mind. I'm not going to go say that I wouldn't let my eyes see by looking at the maid. So you have to watch your eyelids, your heart case, because the heart is the source of blood. That's where it all begins. So what's the solution? You're having a lust in your heart towards women, then go and find a woman or a man to marry. Don't keep on lusting and watching magazines, trying to masturbate and release yourself. No, go and get married. If there was no Bible in you anyway, you would be doing that. Because your heart is filled with the word of God, you're constantly reading your Bible, there'll be no room for that kind of thought to come to your heart. But because you're not reading your Bible, you're not close to God, you're not praying, that's why the Satan can put all those thoughts in your heart. Where there's light, darkness has no room. But where there's no light in your heart, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you don't fast, then it's very easy for darkness to come in and tempt you. So I said, let every woman have her own husband. That is the cure to fornication and temptation. But we know there are many couples, despite being married, still going out to have affairs with people they're not married to. So that is not the 100% cure because you know, people commit adultery with their co workers at work, their secretaries, their bosses. Their friends at work, they have sexual affairs and they don't tell their husbands. And this is why many women have caused children for men who are not their husbands because of extra marital affairs. So you must have the Spirit of God controlling you inside. That is really the solution. Because even people who are married still have affairs. So that may not be the solution. For those who are single, yes. But any men and women, even though married, are still committing adultery and fornication. Because the Spirit of God is not in them. Another Spirit that entered in, made them do that. And let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, likewise also the wife unto the husband. What is he trying to talk about? In other words, the woman and the man should do their appropriate marital duties to each other. They must not deny each other in any way in terms of sexual relations that's supposed to be referring to. No, as a woman should give, do not deny husband sex, and the same thing with from, from the man. You know, this but uh, we know many situations that don't give into that. He said and what I'm to explain, as was Exodus. 21 verse 10. Exodus 21 verse 10. So this passage is very explicit. Doesn't pull any punches. Explains everything. And you understand why Apostle Paul said this. Because he knew what many people how many people have violated the marital relationship to do other things. Exodus 21 verse 10. Yes. She cannot diminish her food, mm -hmm. her clothing, her marriage rights. Mm -hmm. You see? She cannot diminish. If that was, those are the responsibilities of the husband. So when it says, Granny, the wife, do you this? Now, the husband should do what he's supposed to do as the husband for the wife. And that includes giving her food, clothing, and duty of marriage means sexual relations. So the wife should not deny the husband and vice versa. So the wife had no power over her own body for the husband. 
The rabbi is also the husband, kind of half is the body for the wife. See? That was your husband's body is your own fair woman, and your wife's body is your own fair man. And the both brothers said, be fraudy not one the other, except if you consent to a time when you give yourself to fasting and prayer. I was you mustn't deny yourself, except by mutual consent. But what do we find today? Many women deny their husband's sex because they want to get something from them, or because they're angry at them, or because they're jealous, or because they think so or than another. Oh, I have a headache. Oh, I'm not in the mood. Or oh, they turn that all these things happen in bedrooms. And these are bedrooms of Christians as well. So we can see clearly that God does not want married couples to deny each other sexual relationships. Because the body of the husband belongs to the wife, and the body of the wife belongs to the husband. And it's, once the wife demands uh, sexual relations, the husband must say yes. And vice versa, the same thing for the wife. The husband cannot say, no, I, I don't want to have sex tonight, tonight, or I'm in a mood tonight, or I have a headache, or because he didn't cook good food for me, I won't give you sex. You know, we know that this is common. Many women deny the husband because they want to get some money from them. And if a woman is using sex to get money for her husband, then she is culturally is like a prostitute in that case. If your husband has to pay you before you have sex with your husband, not only is that a sin, but it's like prostitution. You are actually selling your body to your husband, which you should not be. Because if you are married to your husband, that husband belongs to you. Your, his, husband, his body belongs to you, and your body belongs to him by rights. And you must not break it. You must not deny your husband of your body, and your husband must not deny you of his body. You are not feeling the mood or whatever, it doesn't matter. You have to say yes, even though you don't feel the mood. So many women say, Oh, I have a headache. Oh, I'm not in the mood. Oh, they give all kinds of excuses. That is not God. As you can see here, this is the Bible. Say, eh? Is this in the Bible? Yes. It is the Bible you are reading. I was reading that Apostle Paul, who wrote 65% of the New Testament, whose garments delivered people and healed them. He was so anointed. Whose letters are actually in the Bible? And this is one of his letters. He is saying this because people asked him the question about it. You know, they, they were. They were asking about this, is it right? Maybe people are asking, is it right for a, a woman to have sex with her husband every night or whatever? They must have asked questions for him to address this issue specifically. And the woman saying, oh, my husband is trying to have a relationship with me you know, every day, every night or something, is it okay? And then that's why he has to say, look, you cannot deny your husband or your husband deny you, except the concern that is both of you must agree. If you don't want to have sex, you must do agreements. A why? To, to, to fasting and prayer. So when you are fasting, you are not permitted to have sexual relationship with your partner. I know some people do this wrong. Because when you do that, you, you reduce that power of fasting. Because now you are enjoying yourself, you are supposed to deny yourself. So once you do that, you are no longer denying yourself. So power. Part of the power of fasting is denial. Food, denial of water, and denial of sexual relationships. So, if you want to fast, say, we're going to fast for this reason, for the next two or three days, or for the next 24 hours. So, we must agree, we're going to pray together, then we're going to have a sexual relationship, that God may answer us, and that this burden in our life will be removed. And then he says, and then come together again. That Satan tempts you not for your incontinency, that is for your lack of control. In other words, if you now prolong it and say, oh, after all, we haven't had sex, so, you know, you can just continue like that. What will happen? Satan will bring a man or a woman to your life and he will tempt you, and before you know it, you will have fallen. So you don't give room for that temptation. Make sure you and your husband are fully satisfied with your sexual relationships. That's what it is.
the same. You know, in other words, if a woman is constantly denying her husband sex, eventually that husband will find something outside and attempt it. So saying, don't leave the room for that temptation. Remember what happened to King, like King David. Even though King David had seven wives or several wives, but because they lost in him, he was tempted by Satan when he saw that she had bad thing beneath his window. And that temptation led to him eventually having sex with Bathsheba, killing her husband Uriah, and God killed the child he had. Because that child was born in adultery. See? So if you go and have sex with somebody and they get pregnant for you and you haven't married them, that child is born out of wedlock. And really, for the Christian, that child is a bastard. And all have that child, that child will grow up and will do the same thing. Because now, he was born under sin. And that sin is generational. He himself grew up and had an affair and impregnates a man or a woman or pregnant for a woman, man or woman before she gets married. See, these laws are for our own use, for our own health, for our own success. God doesn't lose anything. You like go and have sex with as many, as many women as you like. Also going to have to catch a disease like HIV and die or even death. And God is saying, have your own woman. He's saying, don't start sleeping around. He's saying to women, don't start sleeping around. Some women, they don't know who is the father of their children. I just went to a club and I had a drink and when I woke up I saw somebody else laid with me and I got pregnant and I had this baby. See? So they don't know the father of the child. See? So we're going to have sex with several women and we don't know which one is pregnant or not there. The story of the man who, whose girlfriend uh, got pregnant for him and his experience does not agree for him to marry her. I know what sort of happened. Those parents of that girl, they took that girl to America, away from this man. In America, this girl, this lady, had the baby. Then several years later, this man that impregnated her went to America and, <laughs> lo and behold, met that baby. He didn't know what the baby was the one who was offering up for him. Entered into a relationship with the baby. And the baby fell pregnant for him. Now, when they wanted to go to the mother of the girl to tell her about the pregnancy, he discovered that he was his former girlfriend. Can you imagine? This is a true story. So he had impregnated his own daughter without knowing it. And now it's too late. What's going to do? see. This is why sin is generational, increases and multiplies. So this is why God says, keep to yourself. Have one wife. You know, don't have several partners. That's going to happen. So when you are going one day, meet somebody who you should not meet. And you don't commit incest. Have sex with your own relation. Then it says, come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinence, that is your lack of control. Because he knows men and women are weak. You know, men and women are weak. Um, eventually, you will subside and say yes. The man keeps on tormenting you and, and pressurizing you. Sooner or later, you will give in. See, as I said, look, the solution is to have your own woman. And stick to that woman. Don't leave her going everywhere. No, no, no. Stick to one woman. You going out, you don't know that person you're having an affair with. How many men or women they've slept with? So when you have sex with the man, you don't know how many other women or uh, they've had sex with them. When you have sex with them, you have sex with all those other people as well. It says, I speak this by permission and not of command. And that was, this is the permissive will of God. That's, you don't defraud one another. You decide not to have sex if you don't feel consent and for the time of fasting. That was the only indication for the 
now of what Mount Hanani says to your husband is a time of fasting and prayer. There is no other reason. There is no like, oh, I'm not in the mood. Oh, I have a headache. Oh, you didn't give me money. Oh, I didn't like the way you talked to me. Oh, I'm upset with you. No, no, no. Those are not biblical indications for the now sexual relations with your partner. Always remember that. Your body belongs to the partner and vice versa. So, it says, I go to um, 7 Corinthians 8, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. 7 Corinthians 8, verse 8. And that says, speaking of a commandment for by occasional forwardness for others as a full central sincerity of the law, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. And that says, for this cause, when I will no longer forbear, I seem to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and that your body be vain. <coughs> Do not lead us into temptation. That's the Lord's prayer. It's a very, very powerful prayer. Because all around men and women today, there are temptations everywhere. Go to Facebook, you see people having sex free. On Facebook. Go to any of this uh, Instagram, you see open liberty, all kinds of things you never see, you see them. So you need God's Spirit to control you before you fall to temptation. For I would that all men were even as I myself, you see. Why did he say that? Because he was not married. And we don't have a record of him ever having a relationship with a woman who was single and he fully devoted his life to serving God. This is why he could write 65 percent of the New Testament. Because he had no distractions about children, about the wife, wife's family, wife's in laws, all this headache that people who get married have. Oh, I have to attend to my in law. Oh, my in law is coming. I have to give him money. Oh, my uh, wife's sister needs money. You know, all these issues, he didn't have to deal with it. He was totally focused on God. That's why I said, I wish that all men were like himself. They didn't have all these problems. But every man has his own proper gift of God. One after this man, and another after that. When I was, he reacted his ability to deny himself as a gift of God. It's true. Not many men can deny themselves of sexual relationships unless the God is in you because you are born naturally to have sexual relations. That's the natural way God has made man. If God made man like Paul, then there are no children of this kind. Because no man would have known to be interested in having an affair with a woman. But he maybe asked for it or something, but God gave him that gift to deny himself of sexual relationships and to live a very life to him. This is the price he paid. See, this is part of carrying the cross. He determined that no, I'm going to keep myself to myself, I'm going to deny myself, I'm going to sanctify myself, and with that side, God fully went time. And God gave him the ability to say, no, that there are many women and men who claim that they are doing this, but actually they are not. We have stories of pastors, Catholic priests, who have had several children, but on the surface, they are Catholic priests. The same thing with many Catholic, female Catholic priests, nuns. Many of them have gone to have abortions secretly, having had affairs with the Catholic priests. You see? So those people have to answer to God. So if you cannot contain yourself, don't go and keep on pretending to people. Get out and marry. And I was reading a story a few days ago, this Catholic. No, in the southern part of Nigeria. She, she left the nunnery and married. She married a, a soldier, you know, in the army. That's it. Isn't that better than you know, pretending that you, you're content to go when secretly you're having an affair with a man? Hmm? You know, we have to give account for every one of our actions. So everyone has priority. I say that to them married and widows, it is good for them if they're by even as I. This note. This is the message for those who are married and widows. Paul says it's good for you to remain single, like he was. Now I was 
who going to remarry? They're going to say, oh, ah, now, nah, my husband is dead. I will get another man to take care of me. Paul says, no, you don't need that. Just, you know, live the rest of your life as you are. Or they can say, oh, how about my children? Somebody, you know, need someone to take care of them for me. I know a young woman who's probably 35 and she has four children and she's already widowed. So what does she do like this? Well, Paul says that Christ is to remain as he was. That was to remain single. You know? And but I don't know how many women can do that. So, but if they cannot contain, that was it there. Constantly thinking of lusty thoughts, having sex with the opposite partner. See what it says. Let them marry. See? For it's better to marry than to be born. To be born with what? With lusts. Passion. See? You go and secretly to masturbate, secretly to sext, sexting, sending negative pictures of your private organs to men and women, and watching pornography, and all those things. No, no, no. Go out and find yourself a husband and marry, or a wife and marry. You see, but the ideal state is to remain single. He's saying this because he knows the distraction that will call for marriage and getting married to somebody. And how that man affects your commitment towards God. Imagine you have a small child and they're crying in the night and you want to have a nice video. <laughs> how can you focus when your child is crying and you have to go and take care of them? So these are the things that he's talking about. You know, or you want to go and talk about your past, you remember you have to pay your rent. And oh gosh, I don't go and do this extra hour or whatever I'm on my rent. See? Those are the good things. So it says that the ideal thing is for them to remain as he was single, but if not, go and marry. It's better to marry than to burn. Because marriage gives you the legal right to have sex with a husband. That's the only ground that God allows a man and a woman to have sex with each other. It's only in marriage. So very, very clear. Not outside marriage. Not extramaritally, no. It's only a legal marriage. Now, if you're living with a woman and a man, and you haven't paid the back price for that woman, you are committing fornication. See? Because once you pay the back price, you are not recommended as married to her. And many of you doing this. Yes, if you're living with a girl, even here, you are living with a girl for years. They're living like you're married. And you're not married to them. You haven't gone to meet their parents, to get their consent, to marry their daughter, and you're sleeping with each other as man and father, as well as married people. That is a sin against God. You better repent of it. And uh, ask God to forgive you. So, it's so up to the married that command, get not out of the Lord, let not the wife be back from her husband. Why did he actually say that? Because he knew that in most cases, it is the wife that who has her rules. <laughs> That's why I say this. You know, you hardly find men saying, oh, I'm leaving home. No, I don't like him. Hardly ever. It's usually the women. That's why he pointed it out. Let the wife be back from her husband. So women should know this. Actually, the only ground for divorce, the only biblical ground is marital. Infidelity, you know, adultery, that's what Jesus said. It's the only ground when you say, ah, I'm going to divorce my wife, and God would agree with you. That is the only kind. I know nowadays there are all kinds of issues with, you know, wife abuse, violence, all these things that are going on, you know. But I'm talking about the Bible here. It said, but an issue in the Bible was if, for instance, your husband is beating you, and not beating you to death, and to start me or whatever, would you say, ah, if I stay in this place, I'm going to die tomorrow. That's it, I'm going to see what happens. He even called that area because he recognized that there are some situations whereby it's not adultery that's causing the separation. There are other serious issues abuse, violence, denial, all kinds of questions, all kinds of things outside adultery. And the wife says, no, I cannot continue with this. 
to be in. So that what he decided to leave that small house to let her remain on married. Malachi 2 14, Matthew 5 32. Some of you don't know what God says about divorce. I was going to hear it right now. I once read this passage to a close friend of mine and I was shocked. He didn't know the verse was in the Bible. Malachi 2 4. 2 14, rather. Yes, it says. Mm -hmm. Scriptures. 
That's why I said, if you divorce, separate from your husband, then don't go and remarry another person. If you want to go back to marriage, go back to your husband. Otherwise, remain single. Eh? And I remain single. I'm 30 years of age. Ah, do you think I don't have my own needs? I can't, ah, I can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, try and reconcile back to your husband. Pray to God to get you back together. Again. God has done worse than that. He's healed marriages that have been impossible. People have hated each other. God has done it. Pray to God. Why? Because you know that if you are married to that woman, a uh, man, you committed adultery according to the Bible's terms. See? So, and it goes on to of other issues, but this is where uh, someone ends today. So you can see the standard of God in marriage is very high. God only recognizes sexual relationships in a marital relationship, not outside. Not before or after. And the only political ground for divorce is marital infidelity or adultery. Exactly. And if you want to divorce your husband, the best decision is to remain single. But if you want to get married again, go back to your husband. Don't marry another man. When the Old Testament says that that man is defiled, if you want to do that. So God recognizes marriage in heaven as between you and the woman. He doesn't see any of that human being. That's what we read in Malachi. I said, I hate divorce. You made a covenant before me, you marry this man, you marry this woman. As far as I was concerned, that is it for the rest of your life. If you're going to divorce that man or woman and marry somebody else, you sin against me. I don't recognize that marriage. That's what God is saying here, black and white. So we don't give us the spirit to do this, but the ideal state is to remain single. If you divorce or even before you marry, and choose to say, God, I'm going to give my sexual urges to you in exchange for your holiness, in exchange for your power, I will remain single for the rest of my life. That's called the power of celibacy. Now, people that do that, they take the vow. They're not going to enter into a sexual relationship. And those people are usually very, very holy towards God because they are fully focused on God. And Paul was like that. He never married to he died. But as I said, he can't do that except God gives you the gift. So if you're watching me today and you have not yet surrendered your, your life to Christ, maybe you're going through a course of all kinds of temptations. They're involved in masturbation, pornography, fornication, all these things, and you cannot control it. You try your best, you can't stop it. You watch porn movies from morning to night. You know that you need deliverance. And the first way is by surrendering your life to Christ. Cry out to him tonight. Say, Jesus, come and save my soul. We need the power to stop those habits. Confess your sins to him. Or say the simple prayer with me, Lord Jesus. I've sinned against God and man. Have myself forgiven my sins. Wash my sins away with your precious blood. Come inside my heart. Begin to rule and reign over my life. Take my name from the book of the dead and put my name in the book of life. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. When you sweep the Make this confession and this prayer. The Bible says we are saved. Jesus Christ will cancel every sin you committed to that point. He will enter your heart. His spirit will come in your heart and your life will change. It will take, take a drastic turn. All those fun movies you are watching, you just find that you don't have any feelings anymore for them. You don't run after men, you don't smoke, you don't drink anymore. Because now there's a new power inside you. The power of the Spirit of God. And you start to join me to the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Jehovah Jesus Christ, God of Michael. God of holiness and righteousness, we thank you for this precious words of blessing to us today. Heavenly Father, let us go sing deep in your spirit. Give us the revelation of denial of our flesh. Give us the power to be committed to our marital partners. Give us the revelation that 
sexual relations are only permitted within marriage relationship. For those who are straight and violating your laws, God forgive them. Bring them back to yourself. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's it for tonight. Let's this was seen deep in your spirits. Read this passage again, as God to give you revelation of the standard of marriage. And if you better listen it, as God to forgive you and give you the power to say no to further sinfulness. Take care and God bless. Amen. A miracle of walking God is a miracle of walking God is the Alpha and Omega is a miracle of walking God. Hallelujah.